In part one, I'm going to talk about ST segment vectors and its effect on the electrocardiogram. It's important to note that the word ischemia does not mean necrosis. Ischemia means inadequate blood flow. In this talk, I will discuss myocardial infarcts. Transient ischemia will cause angina pectoris, and angina just simply means chest pain, uh, which may radiate to the left arm and neck or jaw. But it does not mean necrosis. Sustained severe ischemia, however, produces a myocardial infarct, and an MI means necrosis. I do want to define the word STEMI here. It means ST elevation myocardial infarct. Most of this talk will be referring to STEMIs. There's also a non-STEMI or N-STEMI, which simply means ST depression. Looking at our myocyte action potential and comparing it with an electrocardiogram, phase four is diastole, phase zero is the onset of the action potential, phase one action potential is beginning to decline, then by phase two we see a plateau period in which all the myocytes are contracted and then phase three is relaxation. The EKG at the bottom is actually a combination of several myocytes, not just this one. The ST segment represents the plateau phase of the myocyte's action potential. If there's an injury, the first thing that we notice is that the cell cannot maintain its membrane potential. It begins to depolarize. In addition, because of the smaller concentration gradient between inside and outside, the action potential is also reduced in amplitude. Wherever you see a difference in voltage, there will be a current flowing, and with that current you can describe a vector. Current flows from the most depolarized to the most polarized region. If we look here, we can see that the injured site is depolarized. As a result, current is going to flow toward the healthy site. So during diastole, we should see movement away from the electrode recording the injured site. During the ST segment, flow is moving from healthy myocytes to the injured myocytes. Positive flow will be moving toward the recording electrode for that particular site. In this example, there's a positive flow from the injured region to the healthy sites during diastole. There's also a positive flow from the healthy sites to the injured sites during systole. One would expect then that if the flow is moving away from the recording electrode, we should see a diastolic depression. And if flow is moving toward the injured myocytes, we should see a systolic elevation. In other words, we should see this. EKG machines, however, are AC coupled, which means that they're going to determine the baseline, which is the diastolic period for the myocytes, and always correct it to zero. So we will never see a depression on an AC coupled electrocardiogram. Rather, we will see this. It will automatically adjust the baseline to zero, and all we'll then see is an ST elevation. In this example, current is flowing from the healthy sites to the injured site and being picked up by the electrode. In a sub-epicardial MI, flow is going from the healthy sites to the injured sites and being picked up. In a sub-endocardial MI, flow is also moving from the healthy myocytes to the injured myocytes, but it's moving away from the electrodes. So in a transmural MI, we would see an ST elevation. In a sub-epicardial MI, we would also see an ST elevation. But in a sub-endocardial MI, we would see an ST depression. We've already looked at the Eindhoven triangle and augmented leads in the vector analysis. I'm going to rearrange these electrodes into a hexaxial representation. Lead 1 coming down, lead 2 moving up and to the left, lead 3 moving up and to the right. So we've got AVL, 1, 2, AVF, 3, and AVR. The blue lines represent the continuation of the augmented leads. We're looking at the direction of electrical flow beginning at the center of the heart. Using that representation, I'm assuming that we have an ST segment vector. That is, the ST segment is generating a positive current moving toward the upper left. So what we're seeing are ST elevations in these leads, which includes 1 and AVL. 
because the vector is moving in a positive direction toward the upper left, it's moving away from the inferior leads. So we see an ST elevation, or STEMI, in the upper region, a superior region, and we see reciprocal depressions in the inferior region. If I now place the triangle on top, it makes it a little bit easier in this example, because here's lead 1 and AVL, and they're located on the left shoulder, superior region. 2, 3, and AVF are inferior. So the vector is moving in a superior region and moving away from the inferior, and we see that as STEMIs in 1 and AVL. These blue arrows are pointing to vectors which we are not recording. We're recording 1, AVL, AVR, 2, 3, and AVF only. We place the chest leads, also called precordial leads, V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, in this arrangement, and I placed a right V4 right over here, but you could place 3, 4, 5, and 6 on the right side to record a transverse section. You can also place leads facing the posterior wall on the back, below the sternum, at the same elevation as V6. We call those V7, 8, and 9. Looking through these leads, we're showing a transverse section of the heart, V1, 2, 3, 4, and the electrocardiograms we'd record from those six leads. If we start with the anterior wall of the heart here, it's clear that it's facing leads 2, 3, and 4. That's V2, V3, and V4. Whereas the lateral wall is facing 5 and 6. The septum is facing V1, and also to some extent V2. And the posterior wall, it would be facing 7, 8, and 9, should we put those leads there. Let's assume for the moment we have a posterior wall infarct, and our ST segment vector, which I've placed off to the side this time, is facing approximately V8. So we see a STEMI in V7, 8, and 9, but it's moving away from V1, 2, and 3, so we see our reciprocal depressions in V1, 2, and 3. Let's look at the evolution of a STEMI. This is a healthy heart here. We can see an electrocardiogram just below it. At the onset of injury, we see this hyperacute T wave. Looks more like a tent. And this happens acutely in seconds. And you may never see that unless you have electrodes placed on the patient at that moment. However, in the minutes to hours it takes for the patient to come to the emergency department, you will now start to see this ST segment elevating. There's more extensive injury, there's some necrosis beginning to occur, and we see the ST segment elevating. Now we're getting into the time after the first day and days later in which we see an expanding area of injury, continued necrosis occurring. The ST segment is still elevated, the T wave now inverts. Now the necrosis is complete. Within the weeks, the ST segment returns to its baseline position, the T wave remains inverted. Within months, we see scar tissue forming. This is collagen fiber scar tissue forming. At this point, the T wave is now reverting to its upright position. Now this scar tissue is non-conductive, electricity can't pass through it, nor is it contractile. So this heart is now weaker and the electrical activity is going to have to pass around that region rather than through it. Another interesting point is, starting from here, and we see it now growing, this abnormal Q wave. This is a pathological Q wave that persists, and it's important to point out that it normally persists. However, in possibly 30% of inferior infarcts, we see non-Q wave infarcts. And you may also see Q waves that are not infarcts. For instance, left ventricular hypertrophy could cause a Q wave to increase. Pericarditis could do that, as well as on some occasions, hyperkalemia can cause an abnormal Q wave. What you want to look for are two or more consecutive Q waves that indicate this was an old infarct. In the next animation, we'll see acutely the hyperacute T wave, followed by a STEMI, and you'll notice it begins to slow down with time because these changes take longer with time. Here's the hyperacute T wave. We're seeing a STEMI. T wave is inverting. Q wave is growing. ST segment is returning to normal. T wave is beginning to revert back to its upright position. As we get into the months, we see it's beginning to grow. And at the end, we see that Q wave persisting. That's the end of part one for this discussion.